go ahead. Thanks, Noel and Tony. And I assume um, my presentation is viewable now by everyone. Yes, it is. Look, yep. Um, look, overall, what I've got is just about 20 slides, just looking at the the big picture for the lamb and, and mutton market. Um, you know, you have a look at where we are this year compared to the prices we were seeing last year. Um, you know, and there's been a significant change. Um, when we look at the supply side of things, you know, for the first eight months of this year, we've slaughtered an extra 1.4 million lambs. Um, most of that has to do with pretty much a run of of two to two and a half good years of, of wet conditions and, and very good marking and marking rates. We've had a, a very um, focused effort by a lot of producers to rebuild their flocks after so many years of drought. Um, we've also seen mutton production this year climb. Um, sheep flock is growing, we estimated about two to three percent per year, um, but I think that is slowing. Um, all feedback we're getting now from producers is that it's slowing. Um, and I think we're seeing a, a bit of seasonal pressure back on a lot of regions that are looking for a bit of rain at the moment, um, just to give them the confidence to continue either carrying more numbers or finishing stock for, for sale. But really focusing on the lamb side of things, um, you know, slaughter at 1.4 million so far this year. It's probably exceeded our initial numbers of what we thought, um, but again goes back to some, some almost historically high um, joining and, and branding rates that we saw in the last few years, and we're seeing a lot of those lambs come through the, into the market this year. So some of the declining price you've seen has to do with the increased supply, but on the other side of that, demand also hasn't been too flash across a lot of markets this year. Um, and that's feeding into nearly the other half of the decline in price this year. You know, for a lot of markets, consumer demand's been flat, um, and particularly we're seeing fallout from what effectively is a small market for Australian lamb, which is Europe, but because New Zealand has found it very difficult into that market, they're pushing their product into other markets like China and the Middle East. That's putting downward pressure on the prices that Australian exporters can ask for product, and that's also being reflected back into the sale yards. Overall, we still see the long-term outlook as, as pretty positive. Um, you know, global supplies of sheep are still low. It's just at the moment, you know, consumers don't want to pay the price for what is a more expensive protein item compared to chicken and pork and beef in most markets. The other thing that's put the, the dampener on prices so far this year has been the skins market, which has been very flat and, again, resembles the, the increased supply but also pretty slow demand picture. Just talking quickly about the Australian flock, which is which is back at around 80 million head or approaching 80 million head in the next in the next few years, and really that's you know a big decline from where it was 20 years ago, and, and it's no surprise to probably anyone listening to this. But the big point to to prove there is that we produce more lambs now with 75 to 80 million sheep than we used to do with 175 to 180 million. So the productivity of the flock has improved dramatically when we look at lamb production. We're seeing that now in the run of good seasons, the amount of lambs coming through. We expect to see that flock number grow over the next few years, but I think the, the big increase that we've seen in the last two years will slow. But again, contrasting where Australia is at, of, of actually seeing some, some growing sheep flock numbers to other countries, you have a look at New Zealand, our major competitor in most markets globally, their sheep flock has, has fallen to a multi-decade level, low level. Um, you know, dairy farming is winning the day over there and a lot of conversions from sheep to dairy production. But again, their production, whilst up this year, is still at very low levels. I think its numbers are it's the second lowest year for lamb production in 50 years. So we've felt the impact of more New Zealand lamb in the market, but still coming off a very low base. And the US and Argentina, look, sheep production there is now a, you know, a real niche um, market, and whilst we do compete against US product in the US market, um, their ability to produce more lamb is, is certainly being constrained. We look at sheep slaughter, and again we've seen an increase this year in sheep slaughter, but still at very low levels. We're talking about 5 million head last year and, and up to about 5.5 or 6 million. Sheep slaughter 
million this um, year. And that, that's helping feeding into our expectations for a rebuilding or continued re rebuilding the flock. Lamb slaughter in the last two years took a significant step backwards. Um, and whilst it, it probably could be looked at as, you know, the, the two years of decline that was needed to get the flock rebuilding in order as a lot of producers held onto ewe lambs, um, you know, we're now seeing that feed through into the slaughter numbers. But again, coming off a low base, the big increase this year, and you have a look back in the years of 07 and 09, you know, 21, 21 and a half million lambs were killed. Um, so we're still working up towards that level, but again, it's the combination of the extra lambs this year has put pressure on the market, but also the demand equations also uh, not as bright. And when we have it that we match up quarterly lamb prices and slaughter, you know, and you can really see that kick in price from the first quarter of last year, which, which still a lot of the comparisons are being made against those record prices we were seeing of five fifty six dollars, um, you know, for, for several months there through a lot of markets. I think that's proven that it was one unsustainable. Um, two, it was driven by a, a very um, almost a supply shock um, out of New Zealand. Um, and what we also have seen from that is the lingering effect through the retail and export markets of, of lamb nearly you know, priced itself out of the market there for a long time. It was a very expensive product. While it was increasing at prices of 10 to 15 percent year on year, you saw beef and chicken increasing at, at 1 to 2 percent. So consumers became very aware that it was an expensive product and, and that was traced back to what they was being paid in the sale yards. I talked earlier about how we saw the, the marking rate in the last two years certainly kick up to, to help drive um, the in extra numbers we're seeing this year. Really, you know, we've seen an increasing trend pretty much for the last two decades in the national marking rate. No doubt a shift from traditional merino production to um, you know, prime lamb, meat production, but also I think a focus on, on making sure those lambs on the ground, whether they merino or, or meat breeds are surviving and, and getting through at increased rates. A big factor that we've seen this year and really going against the trend we've seen in the last 15 years is we've seen carcass weights starting to ease. Um, and whilst we've, we're still well above previous year levels, um, you know, the, the drive to that super heavy lamb that we saw in previous years has gone away. Um, and I'm sure Andrew might be able to talk more about this after me, but you know, both the, the message from the processors and from export markets is that those lambs were getting too big. Um, and certainly this year we haven't seen that premium there for the, the much heavier lines. One, because we've got more lambs in the market, and two, the market's looking for those medium weight lambs. So overall, the supply summary is, yes, we expect the flock to continue to grow, albeit it's still at, at low levels. Remember, this ewe flock now is much more productive than what it was 20 years ago. So we are producing much more with, with less, less ewes. We've, I think we've seen carcass weights plateau for a while, but also, you know, particularly in the southern states, that pressure from cropping, um, I think, will return if we continue to see these grain prices stay strong. When we just isolate the Queensland, and, and it's, we do a lamb survey three times a year where we get um, about 130, 150 responses from Queensland. And you know, Merino joining for Merino lamb production is still the, the basis of the Queensland flock, um, nearly about 80%. We are seeing some, or have seen some strong growth in the other meat breeds, but I think in, in the past 12 months we've seen that taper off a lot. And when we also have a look at marking rates compared to ewes joined, uh, Queensland does fall in quite, um, you know, away below the eastern, st the, the southern states, but I think that's pretty much expected. But just having a look at the lambs marked to use joined and, and understanding the, you know, the dog problem through Queensland, um, it is interesting to note that, uh, you know, the, the the number of lambs on the ground is much lower than what we see in the eastern states. Just moving on to the the big picture demand issues because I think that is what's particularly at the moment, and we've just seen land prices this week ease back again, I think that's the, the bigger issue at the moment. We have a look at the Australian market, roughly consuming about 50% of all product we, can, we produce. You, know, you can have a look there at that retail price. Now, as an economist, it's been a really good result to see consumption, um, even per head consumption, stay where it's been with a retail price that's effectively doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier the problem with that was whilst consumers were happy to pay an increasing price for lamb, there was a point where they started to resist. And I think we saw that point 18 months ago. 
um, particularly as we saw beef prices starting to decline, chicken prices weren't moving and also pork prices declined. And it's important to remember you're competing for that consumer dollar. So you know, when you've got a product that's much more expensive than um, other products, yes, it's value-wise, it can talk, but uh, also consumers during this time have been very price sensitive as well. So that's worked against lamb. And just showing you here, if you have a look over the last three years, the average retail price for lamb increased 10%, beef went down 3%, and chicken went down 4%. So as I said, the last two years, consumers have been less willing to spend money across all categories, let alone meat. Um, and you know, lamb has really put itself uh, heading in the other direction from the other protein items that, that, that it compete against. However, on the global scale, and you look at the two big players in the market, it's New Zealand and Australia. And I think this, this chart really does illustrate the long-term prospects for the Australian industry because if there is a country out there, whether it's in the Middle East or China, that wants additional sheep meat or lamb, there's two places it can go and look. And particularly from an Australian point of view, um, you know, we have a really good wide range of markets, whether it's the Middle East, China, the US, the Australian market to, to put product into. Yes, New Zealand is a bigger exporter than us, but the majority of their product goes into a very nice um, arrangement they have with the EU. Um, at the moment, it's proving difficult for them given market conditions, but really Australia is the, the big player in the market when you remove the EU, the EU uh, trade from numbers. This year, I think we'll push into some new territory, and it's just interesting to note for the October figures, we're actually looking at a record month for lamb ever looking at around 17,500 to 18,000 tonnes, um, really fuelled by the increased production that we've seen come through in, in spring, but also it does show that, that there are markets out there willing to take more product. Admittedly, the price we're receiving for it um, is below what we got last year, the dollar economic situation in these markets, but we are shipping more product overseas. And I think this year will be a, a bit of a landmark year in that we'll ship more product overseas than we consume here domestically, and we expect that to continue to grow. Um, and I think long term that, that is really a good thing for the Australian industry. Our major markets, as I said, we've got a really good spread. The Middle East, the US, Greater China, and then you combine all the other markets together and they're bigger than, than any one of those regions put together. So you know, a really nice spread, um, a spread of markets that would probably be looked very inversely on by the beef industry that is very um, dependent upon you know, a big three markets and we send limited volumes to others. But, you know, the Middle East this year has just gone from strength to strength and we're hearing China are taking a lot more product. Breaking that down by individual market, yes, the US market's come off the boil a bit in recent years, but as we're probably all aware, the economic and dollar issues have played a big, big factor there. But still a very valuable market, still Australia's most valuable market for lamb, taking those bigger product. Um, but also it's a take an increasing number of cuts there because we do have a very strong Hispanic market as well into that. Uh, region. You look at the Middle East and really the Middle East going from strength to strength and what's driving what will be a record year for Australian exports this year. A range of markets, a range of cuts, chilled and frozen. They big plus there is one, they traditionally eat sheep meat and two, you don't have your major competitor, a major competitor in pork in the market. Um, yes, we've seen some growth in the carcass trade there with supplies of sheep being tight, but we continue to to expect the Middle East to really drive some pretty strong growth um, in years to come. And China, what China's done for the industry that's added value to the carcass by taking pretty much what maybe decades ago was seen as just off cuts and, and dog food, um, they're taking breast and flap, they're taking manufacturing beef, mostly frozen product, but they're willing to pay a much higher price for it than we could get in other markets in, in years ago, and that's helping add value to the carcass and providing a very, very valuable market that we expect to grow considerably in coming years for that what is a, a lower quality product going into a market where they traditionally know also how to eat sheep meat. Just quickly touching on live sheep because it's been a hot topic of late. We expect live sheep numbers to remain low in the coming years. One, both due to the, the new requirements um, for exporting, but two, you know, 75 to 90 percent of sheep in any one year are taken out of Western Australia for live export. The WA flock is, is very low, it's halved since 2000, so just the available supplies for those markets are going to be tight. And when we have a look at land prices, um, you know, going back to the last 10 years, you can see the spike there in the first half of 2011, really does um, 
you know, push it up considerably, but things are back pretty much sitting on about a five year average price now and, and you know, having a look what we thought, probably lower than where we would have expected middle of the year. Um, but I think again I've, I've highlighted the reasons for that. Um, but we expect to see those prices still remain average um, against the you know, against the five year average favourable um, over the next few years. So just wrapping up, conscious to leave some time for questioning and for Andrew that you know what does this all mean? I still think flock rebuilding is underway and I think it's going to continue. I think a lot of the momentum or the the rapid momentum that was behind it through the last two wet years may have come off a little bit, but I still think we're in a rebuilding mode. Land production will increase again next year, but it won't increase by the same magnitude it has this year, which is again has come off a low base. But again, we know global sheep meat supplies remain tight. The thing that we're watching uh, very closely here is obviously the Australian dollar. The more you export, the more crucial that dollar level becomes. Watching very slowly how the European market recovers and also how much product New Zealand does put in there. If we see that European market recover um, into 2013 and 2014, New Zealand will start to fill that market again and that will take supplies away from the Middle East and China that they're shipping there now. But I think the big thing overall that we've probably witnessed in the last two to three years and that we're very watching closely is just the price competitiveness of lamb at retail, both in Australia and, and globally. Um, you know, it, it, it really did get to a stage there where lamb had, had got too expensive for a lot of consumers. We started to see it disappear off restaurant menus and that, was a, that should be a concern for the industry. I think now with these lower prices, um, we've seen that turnaround and lamb being pushed by major supermarkets has helped get consumers back. Uh, eating it, um, but it's again one that we look at very closely. So I think overall, you know, for me the outlook for the land market is still good. Um, it just mightn't be as, as bright and rosy and, and optimistic as it was 12 months ago. So that's it for me, Tony and, and Noel. Um, I'll be looking forward to hearing Andrew speak and hang around for some questions. Okay, thanks very much, Tim, for that. Uh, I'll just uh, check to see if there's any questions. Anyone uh, uh, wants to raise their hand if they've got any questions, just uh, or uh, chat in the question box if you've got a question. At the moment, I can't see any uh, questions. I don't think in the question box. No, but feel free if uh, if you have got a question to put up your hand. Um, and we will see if we can answer any of your questions. Oh, here's one, I think Stuart Barkler. He had his hand up, but it looks like it's gone down again. I'll just unmute Stuart. Yes. Stuart, did you have a question? Stuart, did you have a question? Yes, uh, sorry, not my problem yet. Yeah, Stuart, I can hear you. It's uh, if you if you've got a question, um, yeah, fire away. Uh, uh, yeah, no, just uh, just a query on on uh, uh, what we're being told by a lot of our our uh, uh, urban-based friends that the uh, price of lamb in the butcher shop hasn't come down at all and uh, surely we should be starting to see that happen with, with the price we're getting at the moment. Could you answer yep. that Tim? About the, can you hear the price? Yeah I can. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah I mean we we do a, um, a survey of butchers every two weeks um, and we're seeing mixed reports of what the retail price of lamb is doing across across different regions. Um, you have a look at what the major retailers did, uh, Woolies and Coles, um, probably about six weeks ago with their big lamb discounting. We heard some outstanding sales results from that. Um, so it is very mixed about that butcher price of what's going on. I think the thing to point out is at least it, one positive is the price of stock going up, consumers. Um, and that's, that's at least trying to keep lamb price competitive across a lot of markets. Fair enough. Yep. 
Has anybody else got any questions just at the moment before we move off? We will have uh, further questions at the end for Tim and uh, Andrew. So uh, if we don't have any, I can't see any hands up. Uh, what we can do is uh, uh, move on to uh, Andrew's presentation. So, uh, uh, Noel, I'll just see whether I've got you unmuted. TVs. No. Hey, can you hear me, Noel? I certainly can, Tan. Can you introduce Andrew, please? I can, I can. It would be a great pleasure. Um, it's with some pleasure that I introduce uh, Andrew Jackson from TNR. T Andrew's always been um, happy to oblige with uh, presentations such as this. I've listened to a few over time now and they've always been useful and interesting. Uh, Andrew, for those who don't know, is the Northern Livestock Manager for TNR Pastoral. TNR operates the local Wollongarra and the Tamworth abattoirs and between them these abattoirs have the capacity to process about 9,000 small livestock units per day. So they're significant players in our market. Uh, Wollongarra, as people probably will know, processes sheep, lambs and goats and, and Tamworth processes uh, lambs only. Um, it's with pleasure that I introduce Andrew, and Andrew, if you can um, take control and um, talk away. Yeah, well, thanks, Noel. That's coming across all right, is it? Yes, I can hear yep, you very clearly. Up. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen, and um, it's great to see so many people that attend the uh, webinar. I, it's probably coming at a very difficult time and uh, we'll be shot down in flames in, in a lot of ways, but uh, unfortunately I can't uh, help where the market is. Just a brief introduction, um, as I, I was, uh, Noel pointed out, I am the Northern Livestock Manager for TNR Pastoral, fourth generation uh, Jackson buying out the Armadale Sayard, so we've been in the meat industry for some time. Um, TNR Pastoral took over Country Fresh some three years ago now and uh, it now is one of the largest small stock processes in Australia. We process up to 120,000 small stock units per week, 4,000 cattle per week, and we have a uh, combined uh, turnover of in excess of one billion uh, a year. So, and uh, we're currently employing 3,000 people, exporting to 52 countries. Just recently we purchased uh, a half share in Holco uh, Food Distribution and that's a value adding um, business that was based out of Adelaide uh, and it has a $120 million turnover. So it's a company that's risen from um, a small APCO based type um, uh, setup where they had four employees 30 years ago, uh, sorry, three employees 30 years ago to date where they've got over 3,000. So um, it's a great, uh, great success story and it's uh, Australian owned. I'd just like to sort of touch on a few things and Tim has talked about a few of the things where we are at the present time. And I just, I suppose it just gives me justification to where the market is and what, why it is. Um, with the a lot of the, 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 the regions coming into full swing in land production, as it's turned out, we've got four major areas, or, or we call four major areas, have actually got their suckers all coming into one point and they're coming in at the present time. So we've got the central part of New South Wales, we've got the River Arena, and now um, South Australia and Victoria, ben, uh, being Bendigo and Ballarat. That in itself has created a, a deluge of numbers and, and putting a fair bit of pressure on the market. And this week we've seen lambs come from a high of four dollars ten twenty on leg back to three fifty and, and and less. So the onset of lambs coming all in at one period has really put a lot of pressure on the market. Also, we're seeing 
limited restocker demand and no doubt uh, you guys have got stock out there that you're trying to sell. Um, consequently, so you know, I, I'm getting quite a three five year old ewes and weathers where 12, 18 months ago, you know, I was lucky to get quoted a, a seven year old ewe. So we've got those two factors coming in, in into play. Another another factor that we're seeing the market uh, being subdued as it is, is with the uh, the slowing of the, the live export trade, and whereas we, we we traditionally wouldn't buy a lot of those middle range weathers, um, we're getting quoted those every day at the present time. So, you know, there's a number of factors that we're we're seeing at the present time that is is is, is increasing our supply. As Tim said, our increase in kill, uh, you know, I think we're up around 15, 18 percent up on this time last year. Which is a great thing. It's take, it's, it is taking up a lot of that slack, and we are killing as many as we can at the present time. Nationwide yardings have dropped, and that usually happens on a on a subdued type market. When you've got a a, a pretty uh, uh, aggressive market where the market's on fire, a lot of the stock end up in the sales. But at the present time, we are seeing those land, lands and sheep uh, being consigned to us direct. Um, we also have got a very, very um, drawing conditions in northern New South Wales and Queensland, and no doubt a lot of you guys are looking to the skies. But just just here in the New England, we've gone from a, a very, very good uh, three or four seasons in a row to a situation now that we've got people feeding cattle, and in, in one extreme case, I believe that uh, someone's carting water for their cattle. So we've gone gone from three years where we're trying to stop the rain to now looking to the skies and and that's that's also pushing a lot of uh, stock onto the market and once again pushing the market down. Just at Wollongarra we're killing approximately 1100 lambs per day and 2000 or a mix of 2000 sheep and goats per day. Now the, the land side of it is, is quite a success story for the Wollongarra plant and it was only really introduced probably six, seven, eight weeks ago, two months ago, where we, we got a great client that uh, we, were supplying, we were supplying 500 lambs per, per day. That's now increased to 900 to 1000 lambs per day and we do all the value adding at the Wollongarra plant itself. And we distribute it from that, that point, we barcode it, we price it, we do, do everything that's needed to, to be shelf ready. So it's a great success story and on those projected figures, we, be we believe that those land numbers could increase to 1,500 uh, 1500 units per day. So it's a great thing for the Queensland community uh, as such because it's got a, a, it's got a great future. The land that we are taking to Wollongarra is at 18 to 24 kilo carcass and the merino content is not, not such an issue, um, which is a great order and a great um, thing for the Queensland people we, on, the, on the back of 80% of the lambs produced in Queensland are merinos. The main criteria is that we, we have a two score plus carcass and um, it, it is at 18 to 24 kilos. We prefer an article that's been either on, on a pasture or crop or grain, uh, just to put the right colour in the meat. On the goat front, we, we, we're choosing actually to kill more goats than mutton at the moment, um, in that there's a better market for goat meat than there is mutton, uh, which is unfortunate. And as Tim alluded to before, the mutton market took a pounding alongside the uh, land market last year in that mutton got over four dollars and, and was touching five dollars at some stages there last year. And we lost a lot of customers and um, you know it's hard to, for you people to sit back and say well you know look at it now but you've got to get those people back on side and, and you know they're saying well will it go back to that five dollars again um, and that's a question they're asking but in the meantime they've found alternative proteins that, that fit their, their uh, um, production or, 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 their, or their recipes. 
Um, a classic example is the, the mutton backstraps um, dishes that, that that product goes into um, has been substituted by beef um, because beef was so much cheaper. Um, you know, a lot of backstraps last year were commanding fifteen to eighteen dollars a kilo. They could buy round steak, um, and for around that ten dollar period, uh, uh, bracket, and then that that particular product uh, put with their garnish and, and sauces and so forth was was uh, perceived as as the product that the the, uh, the customer thought they were getting. So. It, you know, by outpricing ourselves, it hasn't done us a lot of favours. The Tamworth plant, we're processing 5,250 units per day. We have got more chillers being built as we speak now. Um, the Thomas family that own the TNR Pastoral Group have put millions back into the into their, their processing plants, and uh, the, T, uh, the the Tamworth plant should be up and going to around 6,000 units. By Christmas time, um, and that's you know that's only another 750 head, but it just soaks up that extra numbers. And we believe we've got that we've got the markets for our lamb. Um, we've got other countries coming online, and I don't think Tim mentioned, but uh, India will be taking some of our lamb product for the first time ever, and I believe our company TNR Pastoral will be one of the first co uh, companies in Australia. To uh, deliver meat into India, and that's very exciting. Um, that Indian market, in that you see the amount of wealth in India, uh, is, is a great prospect for our lamb industry, and I believe that will be a real big one in the future. And um, just watch that space on that Indian market. We've got a strong Australian dollar that's putting a lot of pressure on our, our lamb market at the present time, um, as we increase our export um, exporting. That's uh, you know it, it is a protein they see it over the, over the rest of the world. New Zealand are competitors. <coughs> Tim did talk about it. Where into Europe, they are their traditional. That's their traditional market, which is a you know 15 to 18 kilo lamb, um, and that market is subdued. So they're they're exploring other markets, being America um, and China, and the Middle East. So what do they do to get into those markets? They cut the price. And hence the market goes down. So, you know, it's supply and demand. The the uh, the, the, the New Zealanders have uh, haven't been good at marketing in the past, but they've had to, to find other markets uh, as their traditional market has dried up a bit. Land consumption um, it, it it's it has dropped in places, and that was due to the do the uh, the high prices, but I believe, like Tim has said, the lower prices has brought our customer back to eating lamb. We're seeing that with the McDonald's campaign, where we've got a lamb burger uh, uh, in play. We've got our two major supermarkets um, now selling uh, a lot more quantity of lamb, and we've got a third player in there that uh, we've got a, 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 the Yeah, it's the quiet players coming along, and they're selling quite a bit of lamb as well. So, all and all, the lamb side was going on well with those guys. We've got a, 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 with the Chinese market at the present time. We're, we're sending about one forty-foot container of what I call high-end lamb product into this country, um, and. What I mean by high-end lamb product is our racks, our back straps, um, uh, you know th those type of products, and that is slowly increasing. It, it, China has been very good in taking up the slack, as as Tim uh, pointed out before. They are now taking all our breast and flap. Ten, twelve, or five, ten years ago, that product would end up in South Africa or Papua New Guinea or Fiji, places like that. But the Chinese now have taken that market over. They've got that bit extra money, and they can buy that product, and it's not going to that, those directions. I, I get an email every week from China uh, for a Chinese meat company looking for our bones. I'll take every lamb bone that we will produce. So we're packing a lot of the bones. Um, they send them over there, and they make their hot pots and so forth out of the bones. They'll 
We'll take all the low end product we can send them, and um, you know they're slowly but surely, as as they they're becoming wealthier, are taking a higher end product. And and down the track, I can I can see that they'll be you know it won't be one container a month; it'll be ten containers a month. So that's that's all very positive. Most of our customers, as Tim did say, want to downsize the land. It sounds crazy, and you know, from our point of view, we want to do the biggest land we can because the bigger the land, the cheaper it is per kilo to process it and bone it through our boning rooms. But what's happened, and, and, and here in Australia, as well as overseas, that generally speaking, the consumer is wanting to buy 12 lamb chops for a family or thereabouts, whatever it is. But a smaller lamb chop, so they're not they're not paying their thirty dollars for a, a lamb meal or fifteen or eighteen dollars for the lamb meal. They're buying a smaller product and hence smaller dollar value. So they can put, you know, the, the supermarkets and around the world they can put them uh, the trays in uh, a smaller package size, uh, but everyone's still getting their two lamb chops, albeit they're being uh, eating two smaller lamb chops. So. Generally speaking, you know our supermarkets like an 18 to 24 kilo lamb. Our butchers like an 18 to 22 kilo lamb, and our export lamb that was traditionally you know 25 kilos plus, and we were looking at the 30 kilo lamb as being our you know where we wanted to be. Now that slipped back to more of a 24 to 28 kilo lamb, and once again the consumer, um, and um, that being our you know restaurants and so forth overseas. They're saying we're willing to pay for for lamb, but we want a smaller cut. And um, this doesn't really generally affect the, the the Queensland producers because we've got a smaller animal in Queensland, whereas central part of New South Wales, you know, I regularly get consignments of lamb, you know, B doubles of lamb from uh, that Cowra, Forbes, Canoundra in that area that would average 32 to 34 kilos for B doubles of lamb. So those guys have had to learn how to downsize, and you know, it comes back to our seed stock producers too that we don't want the, the late maturing, big thumping rams anymore. Uh, we're in a different world. Um, people are, are demanding a smaller, smaller um, lamb. I would love to see lamb down the track um, that we pay all lamb producers on a red meat yield, uh, opposed to a lamb that. Is the, the the fattest lamb in the the, the market? Um, you know the old analogy that steggles don't go and buy the grand champion rooster at the Sydney Royal Show. Same same scenario. We we want to get back to a, a base that where you guys are using your genetics to buy the best rams you can, not the fattest rams or or the or the showiest rams in the, in the in the class, but buying the rams that produce the most most meat. Um, and I, there's some good things happening, and Dr. Alec Ball is, is working along those lines. It's hard to get a machine to to project those uh, red meat yields quick enough for these what I should call modern day abattoirs that produce five eight thousand units per day. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm under belief that one day we will get there, and, and I think it'll be a, that we'll see the industry go uh, go forward from that point. For also. A pH test would be accompanied by that by that testing. Um, we do it with cattle, and we've seen the MSA program with beef being very successful. We have got an MSA program running now, um, quite successfully at Tamworth. Um, we do it probably six to eight hundred units per week. Um, I believe a lot of the supermarkets now are looking strongly at just buying MSA uh, branded lamb, and um, I believe that will be the the, the, the norm, the MSA lamb will be the norm, and uh, if you're not in that in that fold, then then you'll have to uh, look at look at what uh, uh, procedure you'll have to do to change that. I talked about the deer prices before. Um, unfortunately, and, and I was one of them. Don't, don't uh, worry, I was enjoying the 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 130 and 140 and 150 dollar lambs. Um, unfortunately, it probably did us a lot more. Uh, damage than good, and we're we're wearing the brunt of that now. Um, we have we have lost some of our customers. Uh, we are slowly building them back now. Um, 
as I said before, we've had a lot of things come in, and, and some would call it the unperfect storm, in that we've got a live, uh, live export was subdued. We've got four major areas of major land areas coming into one, selling their lands at the present time. Uh, we've got a, a strong Australian dollar, and we've got to build up of numbers and 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 dry conditions. So unfortunately, all these things have happened, um, and we've got a global economy and a global uh, uh, customer that's is, is not as strong. But I do believe, like Tim said, this is an industry that will only go forward. We have got low numbers, low sheep numbers in the world. Um, I was talking to a guy that uh, came to our head office in Armadale a year or so ago, a couple of years ago, and he was from Germany. He was the biggest small uh, stock processor in Germany, processing a thousand lambs a day, and he couldn't get his head around that. You know. I had to find 8,000, or in those days it was 7,000 lambs uh, and sheep and lambs per day. He just said that's impossible, but we do it every day. But his, his thing in Germany was saying that uh, with urbanisation and the lack of land, that he will be closed within five years. There will be just no sheep in Germany or, or, or he won't be able to export any, any sheep or lambs to kill. So. We are in a very unique situation here in Australia on a world basis in that you've got your Americas that uh, that are, their uh, population of stock is, is declining too and talking to an American the other day, they're, one of their biggest problems is predators. Uh, um, like you guys in Queensland, they have the coyote and, and they have major troubles keeping the coyotes away. So, you know, if we can, we can all work together. I, I believe that this industry is is very, very healthy. I can see a great future. We're going to have a blip here for the next 12, 18 months um, until a few of the numbers sort themselves out um, and global issues issues sort themselves out. But as wealth grows around the world, so will red meat consumption. So that's a, that's a that's a gimme. That's going to happen. Um, we've got we've got uh, the China and also India, and India is a very, very good uh, prospect. And we've got a company called TNR Partial that are willing to, to, to invest tens and tens of millions of dollars into processing. Um, I, I think if you ever put a graph at the cost of processing in Australia over the last 50 years, the cost of uh, processing hasn't uh, risen dramatically because we've got Processing of, of livestock much better, and you know that that flows onto you guys, and, and you know that's never brought up in many many circles, but it's a, it's a, it's a valid point. You know our major opposition being Roger Fletcher has gone to two shifts, um, you know, and Roger's a great bloke, and I you know I take my hat off to Roger, but Roger going to two shifts it reduces the, the all the overhead costs and, and your uh, per head unit price to get your stock through is so much less. Um, that you know, that's all positive news. You want people like Roger Fletcher and ourselves investing big money in, into adopting uh, new technologies. You know, we've got five, eight robots in, in Tamworth now, and um, every week I go down there, they're looking at other ways of of reducing our labour uh, cost. And um, you know, we've got very successful robots that, uh, to the help of MLA in the early days, that they invested. A third of the money uh, we had uh, funding from the federal government, and also we put in a third. So that and, and each robot was four hundred and eighty thousand. Um, you know they've been a success story, and that was the, from the help of MLA. So all those things of uh, helping the industry go go uh, ahead, and um, I believe that with your help and, and producing the right article, that um, this industry is here to stay and, and it's around for a long time. No, that's about me. I hope uh, someone or everyone got uh, something out of that, and um, we'll uh, look forward to some questions. Are you there, not? Tony, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Andrew? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Andrew, for that. We have got a question. Uh, Rick Goodrich has got a question. I might just unmute Rick. Uh, I can find him in the list here. Uh, here he is. Are you there, Rick? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, guys, both of you, uh, for the, a pretty good uh, wrap-up of uh, where the lamb industry is heading in the next uh, period of time. And I take my hat off to uh, to your company in particular, Andrew, for uh, the investments that you have made. I think mean, it's, it's been fantastic and certainly been great in the south as well. I run a bit of country down there. But I am, I am curious as to why I seem to be able to achieve uh, some 10 to sort of almost 20 bucks better for my lambs of similar stature uh, in the south than, than up here in the north. I just wonder if you could give me some sort of explanation as to perhaps why that is. Well, Rick, I'd, I'd, I'd gladly answer that. And if you want to pull up our four grids for our four different plants around Australia, our highest grid at the present time, and this is open to any, any of you people out there that want to get the grids either through your agent or you find me direct or, or Tony, the highest grid we're paying is at Wollongarra on lens. Yes, I've un. Uh, I've yeah, that, uh, I um. I, you there, Tony? Yeah, I've un muted you again, Rick. Uh, far away. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um. Yeah, that might be. Uh, that might be. So you know, I just sort of. Uh, I've been just monitoring this over the last well, couple of years. Uh, we've sort of run a fair few through. Um, through the avatars in the south, and I'm just sort of wondering, um, you know, like. If, if that is uh, destined to be the case in the future, that Wollongarra will uh, stand up okay. with uh, the southern markets, that, that's fantastic. Well, Rick, and listen, it's a great, great uh, question because, as I talk, talk about in our um, my, my segment, we secured this national tenant for processing lamb at Wollongarra, and it's it's been, I suppose, it's been three months now that we've been processing for these guys where we're doing the whole value adding process at Wollongarra. We've actually had to employ extra people and I think they want to employ five or ten extra people there to actually do the value adding we're doing at Wollongarra. Um, it's up to 10,000 chops per day that we pack uh, for this particular company. So it, it's, a, it's a great thing for the Queensland people in that we've now got a business that it's got a, a, a proper procedure, a model, uh, and it's every day. You know, they've gone from 500 lamps per day to 900 lamps per day. Projected figures of doing 1,500 lamps per day. Um, you know, it's a really, really good thing for for that region and um, uh, the, to the people within TNR that that, that got that order to, to Wollongarra. Uh, I do take my hat off to them because, well, uh, listen, I won't lie. Wollongarra is struggling. And I'm sure the TNR board were looking at Wollongarra and going and saying, what are we doing here? You know, 18 months ago, um, my wife was about to leave me. She said, if you have to keep on this phone to, to keep this plant going, um, it's just not fair in the family. But I do thank you guys to what you did. But we did keep it going. And now, now we've got a viable um, land operation. Mm. No, I think it's fantastic, and, and that's music to our ears up here in Queensland. Because um, you know, freight or diesel and any of these animals seems to be uh, becoming more and more of an issue, doesn't it? Particularly the cattle industry in the north. Well, you, you look at that, that cattle industry in the north. I mean, they're, they're nearly brought to their knees through transport. But that's you know, I'm 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 really happy that the Wallen Gower plant has got a sustainable, and I call it sustainable, uh, land operation. We've already invested over $2 million in uh, packaging here there for, for this uh, lamb order. So, uh, and that's to increase. Um, bear in mind, these, this machinery that you buy, to buy a, a chop cutting machine for your um, four quarters, uh, four quarter chops, is 480000 Everything you do in abattoir is deep. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> Sounds like fun, man. <laughs> yeah, Andrew, uh, thanks, Rick, for that. Uh, I've got another question from Peter Long. I'll just see if I can get Peter. Uh, here he is here. Peter Long, unmuted. Peter, I've unmuted you. Do you want to ask Andrew the question? Yeah, thank you, and thanks, Andrew, for your excellent insights there. My question's really followed up on the, the media and the reality for the milk industry here in the last two years with supermarkets and tying them up for longer-term fixed-price contracts. Are you seeing any of those signals from, and you acknowledge the, the throughput of, of lamb in recent times through supermarkets? Are you, you having... Uh, without obviously uh, sharing too many insights. Are you having that pressure brought to bear? Oh, no, none whatsoever. I just, what, what, what the supermarkets did, they brought it back to where, where the butchers were selling their, their product. I think it was a great initiative from our, both our two big players. Um, the throughput of lamb and, um, is now, it's increased. Um, and they're, they're delivering a, a product to the customer cheaper. It, it's the best thing that could ever happen. Unlike, unlike our meat industry, we've got a, a very strong export market and that's a great thing for Australia. And as was alluded to before, it's going to go above our 50% threshold. And we'd all remember back to the, the days where export was only 30% of our land market and we'd get a hot summer day and land consumption would just drop overnight. And my family's been in wholesaling meat all their all their lives, and you know I never get my father coming home and saying I've got a chiller full of lamb, can't sell it. Consumer doesn't want it because we've got 40 degree days in, in Brisbane, and, and and no one wants to buy it. Now with the onset of of this export industry we've got, it flattens the whole scenario out. So we've got markets for our lamb all year round. We haven't got these big dips, which really affected the processor and it was a, it was a bad, a very bad thing for, for wholesalers and you saw a lot of wholesalers go broke on the, on the back of that because they would get caught with a thousand, two thousand lambs and chillers and they'd, sometimes they'd, they'd be giving it away because the consumer just wouldn't buy it. So yeah, to answer you, I think it's been a great thing that the multi, uh, two big supermarkets have reduced their prices uh, and they're, they're, they're uh, doing a lot better out of it, they're, they're getting a lot more throughput and um, the consumer is getting a, a, a better price. So I think it's a win-win. Thank you. Okay, thanks Peter. Uh, we've got one more question or a hand up here from uh, John and Joy Hardy. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, unmute uh, John and Joy and David uh, and then I think we'll uh, get uh, on to the next session uh, of the questions that Noel had sent in. So uh, I'll just unmute John and jo uh, Joy and David. Okay, fire away. Thanks, Thanks Tony. Andrew, is, have you seen any uh, increase in demand from China for mutton? Listen, it is, it is not my field. But I do talk to the salesmen periodically, and once again, the mutton, most of the mutton product is the breast and flat. Okay, um, a lot of our back straps are domestic. Um, we've got a, a huge domestic trade for the back straps in Australia. So, once again, the, the breast and flat from our mutton it was always going to the uh, sorry South Africa and and Fiji and, and, and all those countries. But I, I believe all, well, 90 odd percent of our breast and flap from our mutton is going that way, along with our mutton bones. So uh, yeah, it, it, percentage wise, they probably take the most out of all, 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 all the countries. But it's, it's the low end of the, of, of the, of, of the carcass, it's the low dollar end. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, John. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Andrew and Tim, uh, for those presentations and those questions. 
Uh, I'll hand over to Noel now, um, but just before I do, uh, I will mention about the evaluation again. So some of the some of you may be able to click on this and bring it up uh, while the questions are on. In the chat box, you should see a link to Survey Monkey, and you should be able to click click on that, and that will bring that up, uh, and you can complete that uh, uh, while. Uh, You've got a bit of time if you like, otherwise if you want to leave it till later, but it's there now. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Noel now, and Noel will facilitate uh, this question uh, session well, with Andrew and Tim. Uh, he's had a, a, a group of questions sent in by email, so Noel, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you much, uh, very much to our speakers. Uh, I'd just like to remind participants that um, a recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the Leading Sheep website in a week or two. Uh, so if you're talking to people who may be interested in what went on, what uh, Andrew and Tim had to say, um, you can refer them to the Leading Sheep website and, like I said, in a week or two, a recording will be there that they can listen to at their leisure. Okay, we have a number of questions um, uh, sent in uh, and some have been touched on already, but um, either Andrew or Tim, I'd, I'd like you to take a shot at a couple of these. Um, the first one is, traditionally sheep, meat and lamb prices in Queensland peak in June, July and August and this has not happened for the last two years. What's caused the change, and do we now have to plan for prices to be, in fact, lower at that time? Is there a new price pattern? Uh, Andrew and Tim, would you like to have a go at that question? Well, Tim, I, 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 I'd like to answer that firstly. What we have seen is we've seen a, a difference in the way people are breeding this or, 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 or putting their lambs out. You know, we get lambs all year round now. Um, we're pretty much here in the New England, um, not so much in the New England, but the central part of the state, people are leaving in, in the autumn and also the spring. And I think that is the, the, the big difference in that people are lambing all year round. And we're seeing that with the shedding sheep, where a lot of rams are left in with the ewes, and they just lamb all year round. And that has created a, a supply that uh, is continuous, whereas years ago the spring, the traditional spring lambing uh, was the only way that we'd get our lambs, but now we do see an autumn lambing as well, plus an all year round lambing uh, with a lot of the western people with the, the shedding sheep. Tim? Yeah, I think um, I think when we look at it, it's important to just remember how exceptional the last two years have been. You know, we've had the two wettest years on record across almost the east, all the eastern states, um, and that's knocked any seasonality on the head for prices. I think. Um, I also think, yeah, I think the industry is getting better at, at supplying product all year round, um, as Andrew you just said. Will it go back to it? I don't think so. I think where producers have adjusted their their production to to know that you know there is a need for lamb to reduce through the middle of winter. Um, so I don't think we'll, we'll see a return to those big, you know, significant declines in supplies in July, August and a, a responding price spike. I think we'll see prices much more, or supplies much more stable, and that equals prices being much more stable right through the year, which when we're talking about end users and contracts and consumers, that's a good thing. Tim, I'd just like to say too that a general credit to every producer in Australia, you know, I go to the Tamworth Abattoirs twice a week, and it's very rarely you see a bad lamb. The producers of Australia have learnt how to produce prime lamb and do it well. The genetics are there and they're producing the right article, either be through grain, crop or, or good pasture. So it's, you know, the, the whole mind's, you know, everyone's changed their, their, their uh, ability to, to finish stock, which is a, is a great thing. Okay, it's Noel here again. 
Um, the next question um, is probably more for Andrew, and it's about transport from Western Queensland, which is a real issue for with lambs, particularly with the cost of transport. Now, TNR transports thousands of lambs. Do you have any tips that can help producers in Western Queensland with this issue of transport? Well, the, the, the biggest thing that we we would recommend is that they do get their proper curfew before trucking. Um, I've seen it, and I've seen it time and time again. Oh, they've got out of the out of the yards, or we forgot to get them in. Next minute, they're loaded on the truck full. It's the worst thing you can do for the animal. The animal will be full. They lay down. When they lay down, they'll bring other sheep with them. Next minute, you've got smothered sheep by the time they get to Wollongarra. The other thing that, and this is a, a, an animal welfare issue, and we really didn't touch on this, but it's going to be a bigger and bigger thing as, as we go on. But loading diseased or lame or blind stock, it's not to happen. We won't accept them at Wollongarra. If they arrive, we'll be sending them back. Um, we've got people looking over our shoulders and they'll be looking at you, the, the producers as well. And loading lame stock, those sheep usually will go down in a truck. So they'll bring other stock down with them when they go down the truck. And hence, you'll have smothered stock. So it, it just makes sense not to load them. We don't need the do-gooders to have an excuse to close us down like they're trying to do to other protein operation. It's great that I actually can talk to so many people and, and tell you that you know that we've got people looking at, you know, I, I got a phone call from a lady the other day about a truck going through Tamworth and a leg was poking out outside the truck. What I said, what can I do, madam? I'm you know I'm not there. She said, well it's going to your plant. I said, well how do you know it's going to our plant? Could be going anywhere. But this is the perception, this is what people are thinking. You know, mobile phones, and the phones have got cameras on them. We've all got to be so aware of the animal welfare issue. And it's <coughs> it's a big thing about loading stock. We need to curfew. Um, we always work on a you know 16 to 24 hour curfew, and the further the distance, the, the higher that goes up. Um, we sometimes give our stock in, in hot weather a drink, 10, 12 hours before, trucking um, out of the southern areas, um, that does help. And the other thing is to make sure your stock are in good condition. You know, if you're going to stop, send one, one score stock in, in, on a big distance, they're not going to make it. Okay? And, and also, load in the cool of the morning or, or the late, uh, late evening. Don't, don't load in the middle of the day. I've, I've seen stock arrive that was so dehydrated, they rush the water when they get to the plant and this was a wall and go, and they were goats, because they were loaded in 40 degree day, right in the middle of the day. They were that dehydrated, by the time they got here, you know, there was quite a few of them passed away, because they were just that dehydrated. You know, there's a, there's a big animal welfare issue there, and um, no doubt we'll all adhere to it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Noel again. Um, the next question, it goes back to, um, this issue of pricing, and, and it's just a general question, and um, it's for both of you. There appears to be no premium for feedlot lambs, unlike cattle. Is there a reason for this, or is it just how the market's developing? You want me to answer, Tim? Yeah, you can take that one if you want, and then I'll finish it off if you want. Well, just on, on a local basis, um, We've been able to get enough of our premium lamb through grass fatten uh, procedures. On an export uh, side of it, a lot of the countries want our clean green product. And I mean clean green, I mean they want a product that's off grass. They don't want grain. One particular co uh, company we supply in Switzerland who take our top end product you know, have told us no grain. We do not want grain-fed lamb, and there's only a small little niche market for grain-fed marble lamb into Japan. 
We did a lot of work on it when we had the Midway feedlot going. We tried and tried and tried to find an export market that would pay a premium for, for land. And it was very difficult. There was only a little niche market in Japan. But Tim might be able to elaborate on that more. Yeah, look, I think you need to be you know, careful about looking at, at Fedlot lambs as a as a niche market. I mean, it it one like cattle doesn't necessarily deliver a, I suppose you could say a distinctly different product, um, as does you know the Japan market want with you know grain fed beef. Um, but I mean, you also look at it. You know, the last few years, if there's been one sector of the the, in, the, the we're talking beef industry, it's been the lot feeding industry. Costs are rising, and they have this pressure on them from the both the animal welfare, which was sort of mentioned earlier, but the, just the general grain cost is coming into play. That you know, it's making a product very difficult to be price competitive at a time when consumers globally want one, they want lean product ultimately, and two, they don't want to have to pay a lot of money for it. So, you know, I think in recent years, the good season, lots of grass has has enabled producers to finish product um, pretty easily. Um, I think if we do see a return to dry conditions, there may be that that need to supplementary feed to get stock to weight. But I think ultimately, you know, that, that drive for a clean green, what effectively is a grass fed product, um, is is very much a strength for the industry. Thank you. Um, the last question is about ram lambs. Um, we all know that they grow quicker and they yield better. Uh, are ram keeping rams entire uh, for the lamb trade and alternative we should consider. And as well, um, I've had a subsequent question sent in and it's about detailing of um, particularly the shedding breed. Um, should we not bother detailing the shedding breed for the lamb market? So there's two parts to that question. One is ram lambs and two is the tailing issue. Uh, Tim or Andrew? I'll let you have that one, Andrew. <laughs> Listen, ram lambs to me, to me I, you just think about it yourself. Do you eat ram lamb at home? Is that what you want to really put on the, t the, the Sunday dinner table? Um, or if you had the choice between a ram lamb and a, a nice fat and merino lamb that's right beside it that was castrated, I'd take the, the castrated lamb every day. I, you know, I, the, 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 the pig industry has a, a thing called boar taint. And I reckon it's evident in, in, in some ram lambs that you get the, the ram, ram taint in the meat. And, you know, as a butcher that I've been for, you know, growing up in a butchering family, um, I always like to buy something that I'd eat myself. And, and I tell our buyers exactly the same thing. I know the growth rates are better, but I tell you, um, management-wise, um, it's not such a good, good thing. And if you put them on our grid, and you cop the 60 cent discount for your one scores, um, which a lot of ram lambs will be, uh, it, it just doesn't add up. You know, it makes it makes it one of those little green rims look very cheap. As far as uh, tails are concerned on a Dorpa lamb, I would suggest our company would be a positive to, to take the tail off, purely for the fact for contamination. Um, where we, we can reduce contamination, it's better for the industry. Um, I, this morning I just got sent through photos not to do with uh, faecal matter, but it was more to do with grass seed. But it's just along the same lines, any of that that enters in our industry that uh, can contaminate a container jeopardises our industry. So all efforts to reduce any contamination within our uh, lamb industry or, or mutton industry is a good thing. So I say take them off. Tim? Yeah, I, look, I haven't, haven't got much more to add on that. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Um, that's about the questions that we had sent in. Um, if Tony's on air, I would, um, uh, if there's any further questions, um, uh, Tony might facilitate that. and. Um, Again, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tim. And um, I'll hand back to Tony. And hopefully Tony's listening.
Tony, are you there? He might have muted himself. <laughs> he may well have done. Okay, well listen, thank you very much Andrew, I really appreciate your talk and, um, and also to Tim, it was um, extremely useful and on behalf of the participants I, um, I appreciate your time, I appreciate your knowledge and I appreciate the fact that you were prepared to share it with um, our, um, our participants. Um, there's a couple of things that came up that um, I found extremely interesting. The first was the, um, uh, the price grids that are readily available from TNR Pastoral on their um, website and it's tandrpastoral.com.au and you just go hunt for the price grids. Um, I also found uh, value in looking at the projections that are uh, produced by the MLA and Tim is responsible for those and as I said um, you will uh, be able to look that up on the Leading Sheep website at the end of today. Um, I'd encourage everyone as Tony has said in a couple of occasions to um, complete the evaluation and uh, on behalf of all the speakers, thank you Tim, thank you Andrew and uh, that's all from us. Yeah. Bye. Noel, I'm still there. Can you hear me? Oh, you just didn't answer. No, I, I couldn't unmute myself quick enough. But anyway, thanks for that wrap-up. And uh, I just put up on the screen, we have got some upcoming events uh, at Winton, Ilfracombe and Longridge. Uh, they should be able to see that slide there. And uh, if you want any further information, contact me or Alex Sturton or Nicole Salua at DAF. Uh, and we can help with that and uh, there's some down at Quilpie, Thargaminda and Wyandra uh, and Nicole's details are, are on the screen there uh, but if you send Nicole a, an email if anyone's in those areas wants to attend those events they're very good workshops uh, and uh, they're very good uh, presenters uh, presenting at those workshops we've got uh, uh, Peter Whip uh, doing the ones that uh, the Central West and Devine's doing the ones in the South. Um, again, I'd just like to remind you to uh, uh, click on that link that's in that chat box and uh, I will also flick an email to everybody right now as soon as this finishes so if you have trouble with that link I really would like you to, uh, to do that evaluation for us. It's very handy that we have it and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Andrew and uh, Tim and Noel today for their contribution to this webinar. So thanks very much everybody and uh, I hope you'll join us again for another webinar uh, soon. Thank you. Muted.